Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures, Daily Dose of Nature. I'm your host, Sunny Vanderstar. Today's topic is Know Before You Go, Hidden Yellowstone and Grand Teton Safari. And it will be presented by our fabulous NatHab expedition leader, Drew McCarthy. Drew, thank you so much for being here today. Um, I know you've got a lot to share, so let's dive right in. All right. That sounds great, Sunny. I want to thank everybody for joining us today for uh, our Daily Dose. And it's an exciting presentation for me because we're getting close to the summer season. And that means uh, summer Yellowstone trips and uh, a transition from the, the cold and severe winter that we've been having here uh, in the Mountain West. So welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm excited to uh, give people a chance today to think about their upcoming Hidden Yellowstone and Grand Teton Safari. Uh, hopefully, we can head off some of the questions that you might have uh, through this presentation. And then certainly any topics that we didn't cover, any questions that you have, we'll leave time at the end uh, to address those questions. So um, we'll, we'll go ahead and jump into it. So for those of you that have never met me before, never been on a, one of the trips I've guided or joined me for a, a webinar, um, I'll introduce myself. Uh, my name is Drew McCarthy, and I'm an expedition leader with Natural Habitat Adventures. I've been guiding trips in Yellowstone since about 2011, been leading trips with natural habitat since 2014. I'm from Alaska originally, I grew up in Anchorage, uh, but I've been living in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem in the state of Idaho since uh, 2015, and it's where I call home. Uh, I lead trips with natural habitat in Greenland, I lead trips in Alaska, and I lead trips in Yellowstone and Grand Teton National Parks, both during the winter and during the summer. In fact, my start leading Yellowstone trips was actually in the winter. I led uh, winter trips using cross-country skis and snowshoes long before I started doing summer trips. So today we're gonna be talking about uh, how to prep for your upcoming uh, summer uh, Yellowstone and Grand Teton trip. So for those of you that have already booked uh, this trip, you've received what we call the pre-departure briefing, either a physical copy or an online version, uh, but uh, I want to also address the fact that there's probably people viewing that haven't actually booked a trip yet, but are thinking about joining us for a future departure. So maybe you haven't received a PDB yet, but if you're new to NatHab, you'll uh, recognize quickly that these are an important part of preparing for any of our departures around the world. So that PDB is going to cover a lot of what I'm talking about today. Uh, so if you need to, you can always um, refer back to that PDB after this presentation, maybe for some more clarification on some topics that I discussed or that you didn't get a chance to ask a question about. The other topic I wanna address here at the very beginning would be COVID-19. So thank goodness right now, COVID-19 seems to be on the downswing and many of NADHAB's uh, protocols have been, have been uh, relaxed. Uh, but uh, it is worth addressing that it's still something that as a company and as an expedition leader, we're very much aware of and uh, constantly keeping tabs on what's happening in the local area. Uh, any of our trips or not have, uh, you know, we are subject to the regulations that are in place in the parks where we're operating. This particular departure, that would be Grand Teton as well as Yellowstone, uh, as well as the counties at which these, um, these trips are occurring within. So, you know, this trip, spending time in Montana as well as in, in Wyoming. So we've got a lot to keep tabs on. Uh, we are subject to the regulations in those areas, so um, we'll be keeping tabs on that. And then right before your trip starts, you know, we'll address any changes in the welcome presentation. I also want to uh, point out this website here. Uh, you can always uh, get update information on uh, NatHab's approach with COVID, where we're at in terms of our protocols here at uh, this link um, from the NatHab website. All right. So what makes these trips special for me? And why is this trip called Hidden Yellowstone and Grand Teton Safari? You know, Yellowstone and Grand Teton are popular parks. Uh, visitation has been gradually increasing uh, since their inception, with the one funny exception of last summer, actually, both Grand Teton and Yellowstone saw a slight dip in visitation. Uh, but, you know, during 2021, uh, Grand Teton saw uh, 3.8 million visitors. Uh, Yellowstone saw 4.8 million visitors. That was up 28% from 2020. Um, 
so you know the numbers are increasing there, there there was a bit of a downtrend this last summer and it was noticeable leading trips last summer uh, the reason pro probably had to do with uh, the flooding that occurred in Yellowstone uh, and some of the storms in the spring that caused that flooding. Uh, but Yellowstone is is back up and running. All the roads are open, and I'll address that a little further as the as the presentation continues. But why I the reason that I think of this trip is is called the hidden side of Yellowstone and Grand Teton is that you know experienced expedition leaders we know where to to take our groups places that they can experience sides of the park that. Uh, other visitors and other uh, guided groups may not uh, get to access. So this is a group from actually last spring, just about a year ago. This was a group um, at very late May, and we were in Grand Teton on probably day one of our trip, and we had made our way down off this little side road uh, and got out. And you know, from the road, you couldn't yet appreciate any of the wildflowers, but just stepping out of the vehicle, everybody was amazed at our feet. Already in late May, uh, wildflowers were beginning to bloom. Um, so it's it's our small groups, it's our ability to have um, it's two separate vehicles that are small that we can get into some of these hidden corners of the park that really makes this trip so special for me as a an AdHab expedition leader. A um, couple other things that make this trip particularly special for me, you know, I'm a geologist by training, I have a background in geology and in biology, but for me the opportunity to take people to these really um, fantastic geothermal features uh, some of them well-known uh, and some of them lesser known uh, is really a special part of the trip for me. Uh, so this is actually not Grand Prismatic Spring. This is a spring that's very near Grand Prismatic. Uh, we do visit Grand Prismatic on the Yellowstone summer trip, but you know it's crowded. There's a lot of people. And so having led trips in Yellowstone for so many years, I have a good appreciation of some of these smaller springs where you, you can experience a lot of that magnificent grandeur of these geothermal features without, without the crowds. I'm a birder as well. I really love birding. So uh, these are two harlequin ducks that were taken, photos of these two ducks that were taken in that first May trip last spring. Uh, you get to see these uh, migratory waterfowl in their finery. They've just put on their finest, uh, their finest uniforms for the breeding season. And then finally, the wildflowers are just really spectacular in spring and summer trips in Yellowstone. You know, I mentioned that I started out leading winter trips, but one of the things that's really blown me away about Yellowstone in the summer is just the diversity of wildflowers, some of them being quite special and quite unique. These are two examples. Uh, this is a, a yellow monkey flower uh, that's growing right, up, right next to one of these hot spring outlets. You can see the glorious colors of the hydrothermal and hydrophilic heat-loving bacteria that live in the outlets to these springs. But there's a plant life that grows near a lot of these hot springs that are very unique. Um, this flower over to the right, this is a gentian. Uh, it's called the fringe gentian, and it's another uh, commonly seen flower in some of the geyser basins um, in Yellowstone. So to give you a little regional context before we get any farther into the trip, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. And so myself, if you end up with me as your expedition leader, but any of our, our expedition leaders are going to refer frequently to the GYE, or the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. And what that is, is well illustrated here uh, in this image. First, I want to point out that the GYE is within three states. So the state of Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming. Yellowstone is the park kind of right at the heart of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Grand Teton is a park that's just to the south of uh, Yellowstone. Again, right at the heart of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. 96% of Yellowstone exists within the state of Wyoming with the balance being split between a little sliver up here in Montana and a little sliver over here in Idaho. Um, but the majority of the, the, the state that we'll be traveling through the most on this trip is the state of Wyoming. Um, so on this trip, there's two different uh, departures. You can either start in Bozeman uh, and head south or start uh, in Jackson. And so I'll be generally referring to uh, the trip in, in both ways and not sort of speaking in sequence, but just highlighting what we would see uh, in sequence on this trip. The other thing I want to point out about the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem is that it is a little bit of a def undefined region. So by some estimates, it's as large as 23 million acres. And it's a combination of federal land with Grand Teton being sort of, and Yellowstone being sort of the nucleus. Uh, but then it's surrounded by national park land, uh, federal national forests like Gallatin National Forest, Custer, Caribou Targhee, which is very close to where I live. Um, in uh, in Idaho, 
Ranger Teton National Forest. And then in addition to the national forest land, uh, there's also state land, uh, protected state land, there's private land, there's tribal land. So this contiguous area here is what we call the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem. And it's the most intact temperate ecosystem on earth. And it has the highest, highest concentration of animals of anywhere in uh, North America outside of, uh, in the lower 48 states. So to go into a little more detail, um, these are sort of the, these blue stars are the spots that we'll be spending time and spending nights uh, over the course of the trip. So uh, I wanna highlight Cook City, Montana over here. This is in the very Northeast corner of the park, just outside in the state of Montana. Uh, Cook City is a very unique community. It was impacted quite severely by the flooding just about a year ago. So for the good, for most of last summer, the residents of Cook City were not able to access the town uh, through the normal route, which would be through what's called the, the Northern Range here in the Northeast corner. So this road has been repaired. It was repaired in October. And so last winter we were able to access Cook City through Yellowstone. Um, and I'll tell you what, the community of Cook City was pretty grateful to have business back at their doorstep, including natural habitat um, business. So. On this itinerary, we actually spend two nights in Cook City, and I'll talk more about the accommodation in a moment. Um, and can we spend, on some departures, we spend a night at Canyon, uh, which is near the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone and the upper and lower falls on the Yellowstone River. Uh, some departures, we spend the night uh, at the Old Faithful Snow Lodge. Um, Old Faithful Snow Lodge is a really uh, interesting place to stay because it's, it's one of, it is the highest concentration of geothermal features anywhere on earth are at, in the upper geyser basin, which is literally just at your window when you stay at the Old Faithful Snow Lodge. And then uh, as we move into Grand Teton National Park, um, we'll spend a night on some departures at the Jackson Lake Lodge, which I'll show you pictures of in a moment, but it's a spectacular location right on the shores of Jackson Lake. And then uh, Jackson, Wyoming, we'll be based out of there for um, for one, night of the trip, some departures two nights. So I want to give you a little bit of a sense of what, how's the trip gonna begin for you? You know, you'll end up getting on the plane wherever you're departing from, uh, and you'll arrive at either the Bozeman Airport or the Jackson Airport, depending on your uh, your departure. I wanna give you a sense of, of what to expect. So with this particular natural habitat uh, itinerary, uh, the expedition leaders will be there to pick you up. So you wanna look for uh, a uniformed EL with a sign that looks similar to this, this dual logoed natural habitat WWF sign. Uh, you can see both the Bozeman Airport and the Jackson Hole Airport are very small, very manageable airports. There's three or four uh, baggage claims all clustered together. Uh, so you can expect your expedition leader to be waiting for you uh, either right where you exit the terminal into the baggage claim or at the, the baggage claim itself. So we'll be using our North American safari vehicles uh, to transport you from the airport uh, to their accommodation, whether it be in Jackson or in Bozeman. And these are our Sprinter vans. These are Mercedes Sprinter vans. They've been customized to be used on our wildlife viewing trips. Uh, they have some pretty special features that I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, but these are the vehicles we'll be using to shuttle you the short distance from either the Bozeman airport uh, or the Jackson uh, the uh, Jackson Hole Airport into the respective uh, towns. It's about a 10 minute ride, whether you're arriving in Jackson or Bozeman to get uh, to the hotel. So, um, you know, a lot of our guests arrive a little early uh, or early enough in the day that they have a chance to explore uh, explore these, these gateway communities. So there's a lot to do in both Bozeman and Jackson. Both towns have excellent museums that are worth a visit. In Bozeman, there's the Museum of the Rockies. I highly recommend uh, a visit to that museum. In Jackson, there's the Jackson Hole um, uh, Historical Museum, which is excellent. Um, the hotels where we stay in these two towns, uh, these will be your, 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 the night of day one, depending on whether you're a Bozeman or a a Jackson departure, or the, but both of these hotels are located right in the heart of downtown. So the Armory Hotel in Bozeman, um, just one block from Main Street. Main Street is where there's theaters, there's entertainment, there's nightlife, uh, there's shopping at outdoor shops if you need to buy something, if you realize you didn't want to travel with your bug repellent or your sunscreen, all that is a short walk from, uh, from the hotel. 
Likewise in Jackson, the Lexington is just a couple blocks from Town Square, again, walking distance from uh, the famous Antler Arch and the Jackson Town Square, which I think I have a picture of that arch later on in the presentation, but it, it was four arches made out of exclusively elk antlers that are shed at the National Elk Refuge in the surrounding forest land. Uh, all that is a short walk from the Lexington. So plenty to do, um, whether you're arriving in Jackson uh, or in Bozeman uh, on day one. So I want to talk a little bit about what kind of accommodation we're going to expect. And you might be saying, wait a minute, this is this is the first the first slide and you're showing a Super 8. Well, in Cook City, the Super 8 is essentially the four seasons of Cook City, Montana. Cook City is a very small Montana town. It's very remote. But for a lot of our guests, it ends up being kind of the highlight of the trip, just the chance to be able to wander through town, look in some of the saloons, look in some of the shops and taverns. The reason why this itinerary utilizes the Super 8 in Cook City is that it puts us right in the heart of the Northern Range for two nights. So that's the area of the park where we have the best chance of seeing some grizzly bears, best chance of seeing some wolves. So we want to be right close to the action, uh, and the Super 8 is the is the best accommodation uh, to put us in that in that position. We also have a really long-standing relationship with the owners of the Super 8. We've been staying there for years. It's a it's a very small community again, uh, and so we're always as an exhibition leader, I'm always sort of breathing a sigh of relief when I arrive and cook because I know we're going to be um, in good hands. So I mentioned that uh, in the interior of the park, depending on your itinerary, you might be staying at the Old Faithful Snow Lodge or you might be staying at Canyon Village. Both hotels have some advantages uh, that I'll highlight here. Now the Old Faithful Snow Lodge, which is what we've got pictured here, is, is a, as I mentioned before, it's right outside, uh, just adjacent to the Upper Geyser Basin. So Staying there, we'll take advantage of uh, evening uh, opportunities to walk the Geyser Basin when there's not many people around, as well as early morning um, chances for walking through those Geyser Basins. The other thing that's really special about both the Canyon Lodge and the Snow Lodge is how dark it is at night. So if we have clear evenings, the stars are absolutely spectacular uh, at both locations. We're right in the heart of the Greater Galveston ecosystem, one of the most intact and remote areas in the lower 48 states. So the night skies are spectacular. Uh, and then there's options for some um, some more active outings. So if you're a hiker and this trip, you know, this particular departure is not a super active hi hiking outing, uh, because we have a little time at both those locations and there's well-marked trails, your expedition leaders can either accompany you or point you in the right direction for a little bit more of a, an active outing uh, from either the Snow Lodge or the Canyon uh, Lodge. So this is the, the Canyon Lodge again. Um, very, very close to the Yellowstone River and uh, the Upper and Lower Falls. So if you're on an itinerary where we stay at the Canyon Lodge versus Old Faithful, it doesn't mean we won't visit Old Faithful. Uh, we'll, we'll head up from the Canyon Lodge over to Old Faithful and we'll experience the, the Old Faithful Geyser and the Upper Geyser Basin, but we'll just be leaving from the Canyon Lodge. And the advantage to that is we get to experience the Upper Falls uh, in the morning when there's very few people around. I also want to point out the, the way these guests are dressed here for an early morning uh, white walk at the Canyon Falls. This is actually May 26th of last year. So you can see there's still some snow on the ground. The skies are a little cloudy there. It was a chilly day. So these people, they've got hats on, uh, they've got a warmer jacket, and we'll talk more about clothing in a moment. But uh, Canyon Lodge, uh, again, nice and close to uh, the Yellowstone River and to the uh, to the falls. The other thing that's really special about the Canyon Lodge is in the fall there's a lot of elk that surround the Canyon Lodge and so in the morning we often do hear bugling uh, sometimes even from your hotel room uh, of those elk in the rut and that would just be for trips during the fall. Okay so now we're headed uh, a little bit closer to Grand Teton National Park getting closer to our accommodation near Jackson Hole. So the Jackson Lake Lodge this is a spectacular hotel. Uh, you can see here the porch, the veranda overlooks Jackson Lake and the extent of the Tetons, uh, Mount Moran, it's almost as if you can reach out and touch it. The other thing that's really spectacular about the Jackson Lake Lodge is the wildlife viewing from the same back veranda. So moose, elk, grizzly bears, all can be seen from these tables where these people are seated uh, in this photograph here. Uh, the Jackson Lake Lodge uh, has a spectacular uh, entry atrium with 
the same views uh, of a crowd across the, the Tetons. And then the actual rooms that you'll be staying in are these quaint little cottages that are a short walking distance from the main lodge itself. Uh, and it's so quiet. I love staying at the Jackson Lake Lodge. The only thing uh, you might hear again is in the mornings, you might hear some elk bugling uh, if you're there during the right, the right season. The other thing to really highlight about the Jackson Lake Lodge is where we'll be eating. So at the lodge, there's a restaurant called the Mural Room. Probably the best menu uh, of any of the restaurants on the trip. Uh, and also it has, uh, the mural room is actually looking out these windows right here. So you're looking out across this spectacular view. Our dinner reservations have us you know, right around sunset. So the light is low uh, and it's it's just a really, a really great, um, a great place to stay. So I want to transition now uh, away from accommodation. And I want to talk a little bit about some of the nuts and bolts. How do you prep for the trip? Uh, what's provided? Uh, what do you need to bring? So some really important things uh, to, to be aware of that we'll be providing. Uh, we do provide binoculars uh, for all of our guests. These are 10 power binoculars. They're excellent for wildlife viewing. Um, they'll be in the vans uh, and there'll, there'll be a pair of binoculars for each of the participating guests. Uh, in addition, we'll have trekking poles. Uh, so these are great for if you've got some mobility concerns, uh, if you're joining one of the hikes that negotiates some steeper terrain, trekking poles can be a really useful thing to have. Um, we will have enough for each person to have two trekking poles, uh, although often one is enough for folks. I know that tra traveling these days with heavy equipment like binoculars and trekking poles can be kind of a hassle. So NetHab's got you covered. Uh, don't, you know, the other advantage to using our gear is that it will it will be there when you need it. The guides know you know, you always have the chance, oh, did I accidentally leave my binoculars in the room? Did I leave my poles in the room? Uh, if you use our gear, it's going to be in the vans, ready and available for you um, when you need it. Now, that being said, if you're a passionate wildlife viewer, if you're a passionate birder, you may find that you want to bring your own binoculars. I definitely uh, am a birder myself and, and really am comfortable with my particular binoculars. So you might choose to bring your own, um, but we've got them if you if you want them. The other thing that you can expect out of the wildlife viewing on these trips are spotting scopes. So between the two vehicles that will be traveling in tandem uh, with our, our groups, uh, we've got a lot of scopes that we'll set up. So we don't have enough scopes for each person to have their own, but we can usually get two or three people on a scope and be adjusting those scopes and uh, making sure people are seeing uh, the wildlife that you've all traveled so far um, to see. The other really the spectacular thing about the scopes is the ability to do what's called phone scoping. So some of the guides, most of the expedition leaders, have the ability to attach their phones to the scopes and photograph what's being seen through the scope. You can also take short videos, and I'll share with you some of those videos in a moment. Now, all these photos and videos that are taken are going to be uploaded as the trip continues um, to our guest portal. So those of you that have traveled with Natural Habitat before, you may know that one of the big benefits recently is that we have this new photo sharing tool as part of your guest portal. And so as an expedition leader, I can upload videos and photos that I've taken in, you know, during the trip, in the evening, in the hotel, I can upload those images. And people, um, if there's adequate Wi-Fi, <laughs> which is not always the case, um, people can look at those photos or you can upload your own photos as the trip unfolds. Um, this is something we've done in the past, kind of at the end of the trip, but now, uh, assuming that the hotels have adequate Wi-Fi, we've been actually uploading trips and encouraging our guests to upload their photos as the trip progresses. Um, the other thing that's nice about the phone scoping is that sometimes with your binoculars, it can be hard to know where to look, but if you can look on the screen of the, of the phone scope through the scope and then, oh, I see, then it can help you better understand what you're looking at. So we'll utilize these tools um, out in the field. So some of the other activities beyond wildlife viewing you could expect out of the Yellowstone and Grand Teton uh, Wildlife Safari. Uh, hiking, I've already mentioned hiking. So any of these activities that I discuss here are, are optional, including the hiking. Uh, now, the hikes that we do are really pretty, pretty mild hikes. So um, we're looking at maybe three miles at the most, a mile and a half to three miles of walking on trails. And you can see some examples of the trails here. They're not 
you know, they're not maintained gravel trails. These are trails that are a little rocky, a little muddy. There could be some roots, um, but we avoid uh, steep terrain. Um, but one thing that was important to recognize with natural habitat trips is that we are um, practicing leave no trace. And so if the trails are muddy and there's puddles, you know, we're gonna be walking straight through those puddles as opposed to walking around and widening the trails. So if you do wanna join some of the hikes on our trip, or even if you don't plan to hike, I do recommend you bring uh, some light hiking boots similar to what are pictured here in the upper left. Uh, they don't necessarily have to be 100% waterproof, but they should be um, a little bit water resistant. Uh, they should be able to handle some, some more, slightly more rugged terrain. Uh, they don't need to be heavy mountaineering boots by any means, but some of the new light hikers um, I recommend for this trip, you can see these folks here, they're almost sort of uh, running shoes with a high top. Um, that would be uh, adequate for some of the hikes that we'll be doing. So in addition to hiking, uh, one of the standout uh, activities on this particular itinerary is a scenic float trip down the Snake River within the, the boundaries of Grand Teton National Park. Um, so while great wildlife viewing from, uh, from the boat itself, uh, but also it's incredibly scenic. So great views of the Tetons. You can see this was a photo taken in that May trip last year. Uh, great views of the Grand. Um, one thing I wanted to highlight with this boat trip is that it is not it is not a white water outing. So it's calm, flat water the whole time. Uh, there might be one or two small sections where you could get a little bit of splashing into the boat, uh, but that's that's very, very rare. Um, easy to get in and out of the boats. The boats have a almost a carpeted floor on them, so you can either sit on the pontoon, but if you are more comfortable, you can actually sit down on the carpet, the floor of the boat itself, uh, and um, enjoy that, that scenic float ride. Um, also, I wanna point out that these boats, there is no good seat and bad seat because the, the boats are able to sort of rotate as they're moving down the river. Uh, the boatman is continually rotating the boat so that you're having views out both sides uh, front and back uh, to optimize the wildlife viewing uh, or the scenic viewing for this float trip. I also want to highlight the guides. The uh, operator that we use is called Barker Ewing, and these these guides are excellent. They do this float trip throughout the summer. They know where to look for wildlife. Uh, they've got great stories. Most of them are Jackson locals, so I think you'll really enjoy the um, uh, the guides uh, during the um, uh, float trip. I do want to point out the way these folks are, are dressed here. Uh, we'll talk again a little bit about what kind of gear you should bring, but I want to highlight for that float trip, um, hats, sun hats, sunglasses. There can be a lot of glare off the water. Um, even in, in a trip in May, uh, if it's colder, if it's raining, uh, we go regardless. So uh, rain or shine, we'll be uh, heading down the, the river. Uh, the only reason I've had a couple of these trips uh, have to be delayed or canceled over the years is a, a severe thunderstorm. We won't go out if the weather is at all dangerous, strong winds, thunderstorms, but rain, we're still gonna be doing the, um, the float trip. So another activity you can expect is a lot of time walking on boardwalks. So these are flat level um, boardwalks that the Park Service has constructed in the thermal basins in Yellowstone. The one here on the right, this is Grand, Grand Prismatic, uh, amazing uh, hot spring, the largest hot spring in North America. Um, so we spend a lot of time on, on boardwalks. Uh, a couple things to be um, aware of, they can actually be pretty slippery. So in May trips and June, cold mornings can be icy. So we're gonna have those trekking poles there available to you. Uh, we may have to choose to, to not do a particular boardwalk if it's too icy uh, in the morning. The beauty of being in, on the boardwalks in the morning though is that there's far fewer people. Uh, so it, it's a balance, but you can expect a, a good amount of time walking on these flat level uh, boardwalks in some of the, the geyser basins. And then presenters. Uh, so we have a number of presenters uh, that are, they vary throughout the season, uh, that'll be joining us for a, an afternoon or for a portion of the afternoon uh, to share some details of the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem. These might be photographers, these might be filmmakers, they could be biologists. This gentleman here is my good friend Aaron Bott, used to be a expedition leader for natural habitat. Uh, so there's an idea, just be expecting there's going to be some uh, presentations. And usually, uh, if the weather allows, we'll do those presentations outdoors. So your expedition leaders will prep you to make sure you bring your jacket, uh, your hat, if we're going to have an outdoor uh, presentation. 
Another thing I want to highlight about all natural habitat trips in Yellowstone and Grand Teton, both summer and winter, is uh, our operations specialists. So as part of this trip, you'll have two expedition leaders, but there'll be a third staff member along called the operations specialists. And they end up spending a lot of time making sure that the trips run smoothly. So they're going to be critical things like transporting our luggage from one hotel to the next, uh, but they'll also be helping out, meeting us along the road, setting up um, picnics, uh, field meals. Uh, also, if need be, they may join a particular hike, um, like here, over here on the left. You know, if we've got a, a hiker that's moving a little bit slower, one of the operations specialists might join us, and that way they can hang back with that slower hiker, or the opposite. If somebody really wants to cover some distance, those operations specialists will be on hand. Uh, to make sure um, everybody is is safe and navigating properly. So on the subject of meals, um, we kind of split our time on this trip between restaurants and field meals. And I can say, you know, I led a number of expeditions during the height of COVID. In fact, even the summer of 2020. And one of the things that Nat have really benefited coming out of the pandemic was kind of up in our game in terms of field meals. The advantage to field meals is we're in these beautiful locations and we don't have to wait as much time to be seated and to take care of checks and for uh, all the details of using a, rest, a traditional restaurant. Uh, so we do incorporate field meals on this trip as much as we can. And so those operations specialists will be uh, traveling ahead and setting up those meals for us uh, so that we optimize our time wildlife viewing. The other advantage to field meals is there's a lot less waste. Restaurants can actually be incredibly wasteful. So uh, NatHab tries very hard to minimize our amount of waste. Uh, and so we can have a little more control over the meal when we do field meals. Another example of a field meal, we might have a simple early morning breakfast uh, out in the field uh, with the hope of catching early morning wolf viewing. Uh, and then we might have a bigger lunch one day. Um, you can see when we do kind of a simple meal, uh, we have, field chairs, we have camp chairs that we set up. Uh, they're very comfortable, incredible views. People really love uh, those meals. If the weather doesn't allow it, we do have contingencies, covered areas, picnic areas where we will set up if need be. Here's another example of a field meal. The other advantage to the field meals is that we can really control portions. It's more of a buffet style, and so you take as much as you want, there's less waste. Uh, and also we have more control over uh, dietary um, related issues as well. Our operations specialists have all your dietary information and are able to, to tailor the meals uh, to your uh, your needs. Now we will be uh, eating at a number of, of restaurants uh, on the trip. This is the Obsidian uh, dining room at the Old Faithful Snow Lodge and that's going to be more of your traditional restaurant uh, uh, experience. And so we have some excellent restaurants uh, in, in Bozeman uh, throughout the trip. Uh, that, that will be having more traditional meals indoors. It won't all be field meals. So it's a it's a mix. The lunches tend to be field meals and the dinners uh, and breakfast tend to be in traditional uh, restaurants. Um, the meal sizes are large. In Montana and Wyoming, they like a big plate. So I do want to give you a heads up. You know, if you're traveling with a traveling companion or a partner, you know, often you can get away with ordering one entree and then splitting it. And that way there's less food waste uh, at the end of the meal. Um, also, you know, guides, your expedition leaders, or uh, operation specialists are aware of all your dietary needs and preferences, but I always want to encourage guests to talk to the servers, you know, advocate for yourself, make sure um, that your needs are being met uh, in these, uh, at these restaurants. But of course, your expedition leaders are gonna be assisting with that um, when appropriate. So on the subject of uh, dietary, uh, when you book a trip with Natural Habitat, the paperwork that you complete uh, has, you know, gives medical information, dietary preferences, allergies, but sometimes you can book a trip months in advance, maybe even up to a year. So it's really important at the welcome presentation when you actually meet your expedition leaders to go over uh, any changes that you might have had to your dietary needs, uh, any allergies that maybe are flaring up or have changed since you booked the trip. Same with medical. Um, you know, if, if there's been a change, make sure you let uh, your ELs know. That way we can make sure that we are prepared uh, and can keep you as safe as uh, as possible on the trips. And then final, finally, arrival information. Make sure you update uh, the folks in the office at Natural Habitat to any changes in your arrival flights. Uh, that way the expedition leaders know uh, when to pick you up 
uh, and don't end up uh, causing any confusion there. All right, so to talk a little bit about weather, first of all, I wanna point out that Yellowstone is a high elevation plateau. Its average elevation is 8,000 feet. So there's a couple of considerations to uh, tuck away as you're packing for this trip. Um, first of all, you are gonna to wanna to, uh, bring some warmer layers even for the summer trips. You can see here, July and August, uh, highs in the 70s, uh, but still getting some lows, some, some chilly evenings and mornings. Um, so it doesn't mean that you need to bring your expedition parka, but bringing a, kind of a light down jacket that's packable and doesn't take up much space in your luggage uh, is something that I do for every trip, whether I'm leading a May trip or an August trip. I've always got some compactable, uh, warmer, puffy layer I can put on um, for, the, for the mornings and evenings or for a presentation that might be happening uh, over the course of the day where you're uh, stationary. I also want to point out for the May trips, we've had a really cold spring and um, there's a lot of snow on the ground. At my house right now, there's pushing five, six feet of snow still, and I'm not exaggerating. So um, we are going to start seeing some uh, melting at the lower elevations. You know, Jackson and Bozeman probably won't see any snow on the ground uh, when you arrive in late, you know, mid to late May. Um, but up in the in the park around Canyon and Old Faithful, there could still be some snow on the ground. So um, just a heads up about that. And then in terms of um, precipitation, uh, May is actually uh, the rainiest month, generally, normally speaking. That's when the flooding occurred late May, early June uh, last year. So, um, you know, thunderstorms can happen any afternoon in uh, July and August, um, but, you know, long periods of rain or snow could be uh, in store for May and, and early June. Um, so, uh, yeah, keep that in mind. We've just had a particularly snowy May. So for those wildflower lovers, we'll still be pretty amazing wildflowers in May, but they may be a little bit um, a little bit delayed uh, than than previous years. So dressing in layers, you've probably heard this before uh, over and over again. But as you prep for a day, um, you always want to make sure you've got uh, your dress dressing in layers. So a base layer, this could be a sun shirt. A t-shirt, it could be a, a sort of a lightweight long underwear top, something that you'd be comfortable wearing in a restaurant when you take your jacket off um, for a meal. But then sort of a fleece layer, uh, even something like this zippered top would be something I'd consider a light fleece layer. Uh, and then some sort of a uh, an outer layer. So whether that be a windproof soft shell uh, or a rain jacket, um, if the weather looks rainy. Uh, and then finally, I don't want to forget gloves and hat, particularly for the uh, the May and June departures, but really for any time in the summer, a light pair of gloves uh, and a very thin, but a stocking cap uh, is a wise thing to have tucked away in your pack. So to address more thoroughly um, some of the gear, uh, so rain gear, you know, so beyond kind of a soft shell top, you want to have a, a waterproof layer as well. Um, you know, even if you're not planning on joining some of the hikes, we might be set up at scopes, you know, looking at distant wildlife for, you know, half hour at a time. And so to, to take advantage of those wildlife viewing, you do want to have a, a lightweight rain jacket. You don't necessarily have to buy a new rain jacket for this trip, um, but test it. Just go ahead and put it on, stand in the shower, uh, make sure that that jacket still holds up. There's some pretreatments you can buy at, you know, outdoor stores that can restore the water repellency to your rain jacket. But you know, give yourself a week or two before your departure to start thinking about that so it's not something last minute. Um, boots, again, light hikers, they don't have to be necessarily full grain leather, but you know, a slightly higher top is just gonna protect your ankle, whether it be from uh, scuffs or even from a little bit of moisture on wet vegetation. Um, sunscreen, we'll have sunscreen and bug repellent in the vans, but if you have a particular need or if you have a you know, type of facial sunscreen that you know you like, um, bring that or you could look for it in Bozeman or in Jackson if you don't want to travel with that. And then as well as a light uh, uh, hat, like a, a skull type hat, I, I recommend some sort of a sun hat as well. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be full brimmed. You know, a baseball style hat is is perfect, uh, but you know, a lot of guests prefer the full brimmed hats for a little more sun coverage. Keep in mind the altitude actually makes the sun more intense. So if you're used to sun, sunny weather and you think, oh, I don't need that sun hat, maybe you're not used to sunny weather at 8,000 feet where there's just that much less atmosphere 
so the sun can be pretty intense so just make sure you're you've got some sort of shade uh, and then sunscreen you can see i didn't wear enough sunscreen in this particular photo um you know this guest i want to highlight here he's got uh you know even on a warmer day he's got long uh, hiking pants on and long sleeve shirts um mosquitoes don't tend to be too much of an issue a little bit in the spring um but keeping that sun off your skin uh you know it'll keep you uh from getting wet from vegetation uh, i always recommend so, some light but long pants and a long uh, long sleeve shirt even on sunny days and then so we just had this exhaustive list and how are you going to carry all this uh, well a couple things to remember um, in the vans uh, you'll be able to carry a day pack and so natural habitat has this sort of day pack style that is available at our gear store but there's any any day pack is really adequate uh, but you want to make sure you have space for your water bottle um, in that pack uh, you want to have space for you know your rain jacket uh, an extra layer possibly the sun hat um, camera equipment if you're a photographer you don't necessarily have to limit yourself to just one carry-on in the vans you might have a separate camera bag as well and maybe that just ends up sitting in the back of the van and you only access it once or twice throughout the day to change lenses or whatever but um, it, with you you want to have that day pack uh, and then finally your sort of uh, sort of checked luggage so um, on this trip, we really only spend two nights uh, in Cook City, so we are kind of packing up every morning and moving to a different hotel. And so having uh, your checked luggage would be sort of a large duffel. Uh, wheel duffels are great. We do recommend a soft-sided duffel versus a hard shell um, piece of luggage because it is easier to pack uh, and it's a little bit lighter weight. Um, but give yourself some generous space. You might end up buying some gifts. Uh, make sure that that duffel as much as possible isn't packed to the brim also you want to avoid tying anything to the outside uh, you know in the morning you don't want to tie a pair of boots that you're not going to wear um, you want to make sure you have enough space in the duffel itself so that it's quite contained uh, you want to make sure you have a luggage tag on that as well um, and i do want to highlight that you are going to be physically separated from your luggage during the day so our operations specialists will be carrying our big sort of check bags in another vehicle we might overlap with them at lunch, but you may not see that luggage again until your hotel room that evening. So medications, make sure you've got any medications you need with you for the day uh, in that day pack. All right, so a couple things just to, to set your expectations. Um, Yellowstone is packed with wildlife. That's why we, we all travel there, but it's also pretty packed with people in the summer. It can be quite busy and the wildlife has the right of way. So, you know, we'll encounter bison jams occasionally. Uh, other wildlife might be on or near the road causing some some backups and traffic um, i also want to point out that as guides commercial operators we're held to a higher standard than the general public so we may not be able to stop in the road uh, to photograph wildlife if there's not a safe place to pull over uh, the other thing to keep in mind with yellowstone this summer is there's there's four major construction projects happening in the park this summer um, some of those construction projects are related to the flooding that occurred last spring, but there's also some deferred maintenance. They're replacing one of the major bridges over the Yellowstone River. Uh, they're continuing work along uh, the Lewis River. These are all sections of roadway that we will be traveling through for this, this itinerary. So uh, just keep be aware there might be a little bit more uh, construction than normal this summer, which could lead to some, some backups. And then again, the vehicles that we're traveling in, these are 11 passenger Mercedes Sprinter vans, but there's only ever going to be seven guests in one of those vans. Um, so there's always an empty seat next to you for you to put your day pack, your camera bag. Everybody will have a window seat. Uh, these vans also have uh, roof hatches. So if we're, if the operators, if the guides are able to pull off the road completely, as this picture shows, um, not be in the lane of traffic, we can open those uh, roof hatches up and um, you can photograph through the roof hatches. Uh, also in the vans, we're gonna be carrying water with us. So you wanna start the day with a full water bottle, but if you uh, drink water, we can refill it. Uh, and then also we'll have snacks in the vans to prevent uh, any uh, hungriness, hunger. Um, I wanted to, you know, Yellowstone and Grand Teton are big parks. There's a lot of country to cover. And so we take every opportunity we can to get out of the vans, for short hikes, to look at geyser basins, for wildlife viewing, um, for bathroom stops. We make plenty of bathroom stops. 
Uh, but I do want to prepare people that there's just no way around the fact that there's some long distances that we've got to travel. So certain days we'll be spending more time in the van uh, than you might expect, uh, but we make as many stops as we can in order to, to uh, even for a, a short, uh, you know, photo, scenic photography stops, you know, we'll just give people the chance to get out and enjoy uh, what they're seeing. So because this itinerary varies slightly throughout the summer and because some trips start in Bozeman and some trips start in Jackson, I'm not going to go through a day-by-day -day detailed itinerary with you all. Um, I want to give time for questions as well, but I do just want to finish up here with some just some beautiful pictures of some of the things you can expect to see. So in the Mammoth area, we'll spend time at the world-famous uh, Mammoth Hot Spring. Um, we'll visit the Roosevelt Arch. Uh, there's usually quite a lot of bison uh, around the Mammoth area. We'll spend two days in the northern range, that northeast corner near Cook City. We'll have uh, plenty of time to, to add our leisure, view wildlife. Uh, we've, that's our best chance for viewing wolves and grizzlies uh, up there. Uh, we'll also have a presentation from uh, a local wildlife filmmaker uh, named Dan Hartman. That'll happen up in the northern range. Uh, in the interior of the park, we'll spend time at the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone, uh, the Upper Falls, uh, visit some of the smaller geyser basins, uh, travel along the shores of Yellowstone Lake. And then uh, even whether or not we're staying at the Old Faithful Snow Lodge, uh, we will spend time at Old Faithful. So you'll get to uh, spend time in the upper geyser basin, witness at least one eruption of Old Faithful geyser, uh, visit some of the lesser known but really spectacular uh, hot springs, and uh, visit some mud pots. And then I just want to finish up here with a couple um, videos uh, of hopefully what we might see. This is some phone scope video of the Junction Butte pack. Uh, we caught some good views of those wolves uh, through the scope uh, at one point, well, many times last summer. Hopefully you can all see these wolves just tumbling and playing. And then this next bit of video, this is just a, one of these magical moments on the Yellowstone River. We pulled over, there wasn't a single bison in sight. I think somebody wanted to photograph the, the, the fog. And then they just came out of nowhere and proceeded to cross the river in front of us. Um, you just, moments like this are unexpected, uh, but luckily plentiful during these trips. So I wanna pan it back to Sunny now, and let's take some time to address some questions from the audience. Drew, thank you so much. Um, that just looks like an incredible trip, and it's we're so lucky that it's right in many of our backyards. <laughs> I hope yeah. to make it up there and, and check it out with you sometime soon. Yeah. Um, let's start with some questions. Um, what are or are there any? Um, wait, hold on, I just lost it. National park trips that could be bookended with this one. Do you do you know of any any park trips or any other not have trips? that could be bookended with this one or maybe even just pre-trip excursions? Yeah, well, the two options that come to mind would be Glacier and Waterton, and then our Canyons of the Southwest trip. Um, I know that they uh, are running both at the same time as Yellowstone Departures and also are, I mean, North America's big, as you know, uh, but that that wouldn't be too difficult to uh, to do a day or two of travel and bookend those trips. So I would, and they, they both have similar, those trips have a similar emphasis as the Yellowstone trip in that they're walking, wildlife viewing, you know, vehicle time. Um, so yeah, I would think, uh, look into both Waterton uh, Glacier and then uh, Deserts of the Southwest. Yeah, and your, your adventure specialist could help you with any of that type of coordination. Yep. Um, regarding meals, a couple of questions about meals. Um, what sort of accommodations could you make for guests who are vegan? And can you just clarify um, that Nat, who's paying for what? Are they paying for restaurant meals themselves? Do they get a separate check? Could you just clarify what meals are included in the trip and what's extra? Sure, yeah. So um, <clears throat> and first I'll address the question relating to dietary concerns. We, we have many vegans that join our trips. And so, you know, the restaurants within Yellowstone and Grand Teton, certainly in Bozeman and Jackson Hole, you know, they recognize that there are a lot of vegans uh, 
that are customers. And so most of the menus, all the menus, will be able to accommodate uh, a vegan. We know ahead of time uh, if we do have vegans on the trip. So again, our field meals were able to to um, to s adjust and to accommodate. And at that welcome dinner, if if you have a lot of concerns, it's totally appropriate at the welcome dinner to ask one of the expedition leaders and say, hey, you know, I really like this particular vegan spread, and uh, if we're going to have picnics, you know, we can we can buy that in Bozeman or in Jackson. We can make sure we can accommodate some of those more specific requests. It's one of the big advantages of having a dedicated operations specialist on our trips. Uh, now, as far as payment, uh, all the meals are included in, in what you pay to join a natural habitat uh, departure. Uh, the only thing that you'll be expected to pay uh, for would be any alcoholic beverages. So if you order a whiskey or a beer with your dinner, you can expect to have a separate check brought out for you uh, at the end of the meal. Uh, but any soft drinks, iced tea, hot tea, that's all included and not have pays for. Um, so yeah, that's the only uh, the only expense, meal-related expense you could expect to be responsible for during the trip. Hmm. Um, do you know if there's a limit on cars entering Yellowstone during the summer? Yosemite and some of the other parks, at least during COVID, did limit um, the number of cars and you had to have a reservation. Do you know if that's going to be happening this summer? Not in Yellowstone, uh, nor in Grand Teton. Um, I, there's been a lot of propositions over the years to to manage uh, traffic in Yellowstone. Uh, and last summer, during the closures due to the flooding, for a period of the summer, they were alternating odd and even plate numbers, like the last digit of your plate would um, would get, gain you entrance into the park just to, to limit the number of vehicles. But this summer, there's no limits to entry uh, in either Grand Teton or Yellowstone. Okay. Um, in your opinion, what is the best time to see the aspens changing colors? You know, I bought my house in in uh, the Teton Valley because it's in a stand of aspen. I can't state how beautiful they are, and also how ecologically important aspen stands are to the forest ecology. You know, I think September, um, you know, late August, September would be the best time, even into October. Uh, let me scratch that. So yeah, probably mid-September to early October would be your best bet for viewing uh, those aspen colors. Okay. And what about the best time for viewing wildflowers? You know, that's there's that's the beauty of of these trips in the Rockies is that you really vary so much elevation throughout the trip that you may have missed the peak of the wildflowers at 5,000 or 6,000 feet, but we're going to spend an afternoon, you know, maybe up toward 7,000, and then you're going to have that peak of wildflowers. So, you know, June and July would, well, even into August, there's pretty spectacular wildflowers, but typically June and early July are going to have probably the most diversity of wildflowers. Okay. Um, does not have any, have any photography specific departures for this trip? They do. For this itinerary. Yeah. They do. There are photo specific, and that would be another question for one of the adventure specialists. Uh, but there are photo. There, there's sort of two different. There's um, photography expert trips, and then there's photo departures. So you'd want to make sure to really let your adventure specialists know. You know how how big of a photographer are you? Are you sim simply a person that wants to learn a little bit more uh, and spend a little more time photographing, or are you you know a, an expert? Consider yourself an expert, and it would be more important to you than say walking in a geyser basin, you know, make sure you're you really express those preferences so that you end up on the right photo trip for you. Sounds good. One last question. Um, does this itinerary um, go on the Beartooth Highway out of Cook City? So no. Uh, there is the option some evenings you know, uh, if there's in the middle of the summer when we have longer days, uh, after dinner at Cook, uh, it is, I've driven up to, you know, not all the way to the to the highest point, that that's just too far, but we've driven maybe 45 minutes to an hour after dinner um, to an overlook uh, where we could catch some light, you know, some, some uh, evening light, um, but we aren't 
by any means traversing the entire Beartooth Pass. Uh, it would just be maybe a, a third of the way up to the pass. Excellent. Well, I think that's the last question we have for today. So I want to hand it back to you for closing comments. All right. Well, um, you know, I think that these Know Before You Go uh, webinars are just so, so important to give people that chance to to hear hear from one of their expedition leaders and to really uh, get a sense for the, the the packing, but then also just what's the emphasis, what's the general spirit of the trip. So I hope I hope it was useful for folks. And um, if you have more questions, uh, by all means, uh, there's ways to get those questions to to ELs. Um, uh, and keep in mind, you can also watch this uh, the recorded version of this. You may pick up answers to some of those questions uh, your second time around. That's great advice to watch it again because there's so much information. It is hard to get it all the first time. But uh, thanks again, Drew. That was fabulous. Um, it really looks like such a, a just an exciting trip, and um, I'm ex I'm very jealous of all the people that get to go up there and, and join you this summer. Um, I want to thank everybody who tuned in today. Please join us again tomorrow for our next daily dose of nature. You can check out this week's lineup, including registration links, on our website at nathab.com forward slash webinars. We did record today's presentation, and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, we we'll conclude the webinar. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you.